possible because the lion from the tribe of Judah became the Lamb of God on your behalf so that you can become a child of God. This is the good news. This is the one who's worthy of your worship. Woo-wee. Now that's an introduction. But to be fair, I did put some fire on Dalton before he came up here. I said to him, I need you to accomplish one thing. By the time you're done, they need to know that when the next gen prophets come, we come here to lift you up. We come here for your vision. We come to establish your work that God has given you. Our mandate is to make sure that you fulfill yours. When we come here, we're birthing with you and for you. When we come here, we are Aaron and we are her. Holding up your hands for every step of success that you take is our success. There were some that stayed on the other side of the Jordan after the land was taken. But yet, together, they took that land. They travailed and died and bled together. And it is high time, ladies and gentlemen, that we see this manifest in the kingdom of God. Where apostles are fighting battles for one another and not with one another. Where we are helping others on the other side of the Jordan take their territories, knowing that their success in the kingdom is our success in the kingdom. Torch Ministries is not the kingdom. So when I see the kingdom be established on earth here in Balfour and soon in Tacoma, I recognize we're doing what we've been put on this earth to do. I don't care what name is on it. I don't care what stamp is on it. Who is of Paul and who is of Apollos? Does it matter except the kingdom is established? Everybody has favorites. But can we go beyond that? Can we go beyond the fact that since the first day we walked in here, God showed us a movement. Not just a local church, a movement that God is bringing in this place. We had a fantastic opportunity to have dinner with your apostles. And he was sharing with me some of the revivals and moves of God in this season and in this place that died. It's time for resurrection. And the seeds of resurrection are sprouting here. And you look around and you see only what you know today. But I'm here to shake you out of your complacency. I'm here to shake you out of your limited perspective. Because where God is about to take you, you have not been before. The Lord gave me a word in January for 2023. He sent me to the book of Joshua. I want you to, I want to read this with you. Joshua 1 verses 1 to 3. Joshua 1 verses 1 to 3. Anybody needs a Bible? I love this. This is the only church I ever saw that hand out Bibles. I love you so much. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant. Now, They've just gone through a mourning phase. I mean, I can imagine how painful that must have been. Moses had led them for decades. He parted the Red Sea. He, he fed them manna. There were quails. There were so many miracles. And he's died. Now Joshua has got to take on this load. And I can imagine him thinking, how am I going to be as great as Moses was? How am I going to be able to take this mantle and walk it through? I see the great big moves of the past. I I mean, you see the giants. We're talking about all the giants. We we were like going from one to the other. This great man of God did this. And that great man of God. He started 200 churches, 300 churches. There was revival. There was power. That was Moses. And now God is raising up a new generation of Joshua's. And we look at Moses and we're like... I hope one day, (laughs) I pray one day that I could just even match a little bit, that I could just tie the sandals of Moses. Man, if I, if I could just walk in just a bit of their power, in, in a bit of their, 
They're mental. If I could just do half, I mean, goodness, if I could just do half of what they did in the city, we would bring revolution. Not just to Seattle, but Washington. So what do you think it is that God tells Joshua? Verse 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. Moses, my servant, is dead. Duh. They just had his funeral. Wasn't it obvious? No, God was making a point. Joshua, can you get the memo? Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise. Go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I'm giving to them. And every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you as I said to Moses. No, ladies and gentlemen, you're not bringing a resurrection of the old. No, ladies and gentlemen, you're not going to be another Moses generation. And no, you are not going to accomplish anything of what any of the greats did. And you want to know why? Because Moses is dead. Moses never crossed the Jordan. Joshua did what Moses never did. You cannot go forward in the season while looking back. And if the first thing that comes out of your mouth, well, so-and-so did it, and they did it, and they did it, then you're looking in the wrong direction. Because what you're about to do, what you're about to step into, has not been done before. And if you're using the example of Moses's for the next season, you're going to miss your season. You see, the season of Moses created a character, imparted gifts, imparted anointings, imparted power. But Moses got to see the promised land from afar as he breathed his last breath. Let us not waste what the generals of the past paid a hefty price to bring us to the border of the Jordan. And let us not be so foolish that we waste what they invested by thinking we've got to go back to Sinai to try and get what they had when God has given us so much more for this season, for this culture, for this generation, for this time and the generations to come. If you try and step into your next season, looking back at everything that was, that wasn't, your regrets, your fears, your hopes, your dreams, you're going to miss the Jordan that's right in front of you. As much as Joshua took all that Moses had to give him, he had to stand on his own and face an enemy that Moses never had to face and take a land that Moses never took. And when you can shake yourself loose and recognize that this is the most difficult part of the process, you'll get over it very, very quickly. Moses is dead. This is the hardest part of transitioning from one season to the next. You know, the children of Israel are quite familiar with the River Jordan, with the banks of the Jordan. They'd wandered the wilderness for 40 years. They wandered all over that region and they probably camped, they probably drank the waters of Jordan, bathed in the rivers of Jordan. And so they thought they knew, they thought they knew what was on the other side. But they had never crossed the Jordan. They only knew what it looked like on the eastward side. And we can become so full of ourselves that we think we know. We think we know what the next season looks like. We think we know what God's going to do next. We think we know. Oh, we think we know what Tacoma is going to look like. We think we know what the next vision is going to look like. We think we know how we're going to take the next territory. You don't have a clue. Because everything that you formed in your mind has been formed by the Moses season. The things you believe in, the things you see, the gifts you operate in. God did not allow Joshua to part the river Jordan. He made him step into it at full flood. 
an entirely different dynamic. God had a relationship with Joshua that was nothing like the relationship he had with Moses. So the most painful part of a new season is allowing Moses to die. You see, we want the promise. Moses came with an entire layout of what the promised land would do, what the promised land would give them. And you're like, oh my goodness, we're finally going to go to the promised land. We're excited about the promised land. We camped on this side of the Jordan. We can just see it. It's just over there. You feel it. They've been walking in the wilderness for years. People were dropping like flies. Finally, the, I can imagine the day the last of the first generation died. They had a funeral and then they had a celebration. <laughs> like, what took you so long? Like one of those old relatives that like live until they're 120. Now, you know, in our day and age, we're like, keep living on. I can imagine them. It's like, when are you going to die? Because we know we can't cross the land until you die because God told them. None of this generation is going to see the promised land. So I could be, there was that last straggling dude and they were like staring him down every day as he walked out his tent. Like, is this a day? Is this a day? <laughs> Love you, Bob. Yeah, <laughs> And that day, the day came, I, I always put, you know, the, I didn't put it in the word, but I, I just wonder who that guy was. <laughs> He's the one who started it all. Because the day that guy died, preparations began. And that last guy to finally die was Moses. The last guy to finally die is Moses. The last, the very last of the old generation. And so they knew, they knew at that funeral what that meant. It was time to take the promised land. And that is the hardest part, is getting to the place of saying, Moses is dead. What you've done, what you've hoped for, it's over now. We want the promise, we want the blessing, we want the new, we want the resurrection, we want all the exciting. But guys, let's go to the funeral first. Moses is dead. How we thought we were going to do it. You're walking into this new season and you had all these dreams and hopes. And, 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 and I know, especially as apostles, we see it all. But you didn't experience and, and what you didn't expect was the scattering. You didn't expect people to not go with you. You didn't expect them to die in the wilderness. You didn't expect them to leave. You didn't expect the shaking. But it's part of the process. Every time God leads you into a new season, there are things that have to remain on the other side of the Jordan. All those tombstones, all those altars they built along the way, all those stories of fire and power, stayed on the other side of the Jordan. Because every single one of those miracles, every single one of those stories were for the season past. Now, it's very easy for me when God's moving me to a new season to say, oh Lord, I let go of that financial lack. Harabashata, take me on. Take me on to the new. Lord, I, I let go of that guy I've been trying to kick out of my ministry for years now. I'm ready. I feel the call. I'm ready to let it go. Sorry, that was a bit apostolic. The leader's like, I got you. I'm ready to let that troublemaker go, Jesus. I'm ready to let that lifestyle go, Jesus. I'm, I'm ready to, to just dump the old and the bad. No, that's not the death. That's the easy part. You know what's hard? It's letting go of your dreams, your visions, old promises, the hopes, the experiences, the encounters. Because while you hold on to the little bit you got in the wilderness, you're never going to taste the fruit of the promised land. But we have a generation now who grew up only eating manna. They never knew what a grape tasted like. They'd never tasted a grape in their lives, people. They grew up on manna. That manna was their, their daily bread, their anointing, their grace. Every single day God showed up and people were healed and people were delivered. And it's what I always had and it worked. Yes, it fed them. It sustained them in the wilderness. But you're not going to stay in the wilderness. You're going to the promised land. The promised land got grapes. 
It's no manna in the promised land. But you know, when you get used to a certain food, it becomes your everything. Any of you go to a new country, you're like, listen, you just need to come back home <laughs> and taste my food. And they think the same thing are you. You get so familiar with the taste of that food in your mouth, right? So familiar with that level of anointing, so familiar with that grace, so familiar with that mantle, so familiar with that dream, so familiar with that vision, so familiar with that hope, so familiar with that little promise and that prayer you keep saying to God. It's manna and it has sustained you and it has got you to the edge of the Jordan. But where you're going, the manna can no longer sustain you. Where you're going, the manna is not enough. And that is why God brings you to the river Jordan. Joshua 3, verse 3. And they commanded the people saying, When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, the Levites bearing it, then you shall set out from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it. It's about 2,000 cubits by measure. I need you to listen. I need you to listen to what it says next. Do not come near it. Why? That you may know the way by which you must go. For you have not passed this way before. You have not passed this way before. You have not done this before. You've never experienced the move God's bringing. You have not walked in this power before. You've not walked in this pattern before. You've not yet seen what God is going to do through you. So why are you basing your tomorrow on what you experienced yesterday? Why are you judging your today? Because you don't even know what your tomorrow holds. You have not been this way before, but God has and he sends the ark ahead of you. He sends his presence, his glory cloud. Listen, what happened when they first crossed the Red Sea? The scripture tells me that there was a, a fire that God put between the Egyptians and the Israelites, right? So that the Egyptians and the Israelites just couldn't even see each other. So God could give them their great escape. But God switches it up. When they cross the Jordan, the fire isn't behind them. It's in front of them. It's in front of them, leading them through the Jordan. And it's all they see. This time it is the Israel, Israelites that are walking blind. They can keep their eyes on only one thing and that's the ark. You have not been this way before. Oh, I've seen many ministries do this. I know how this goes. I know, I know what this church planning thing is. I know where we're going with this. I know where the finances are going to go. I know how. Do you though? Do you though? Because you have not been this way before. God is raising a new generation. A new generation of apostles, of prophets, of teachers, of leaders. Why? Because God wants to take his bride where she has not been before. And we have to follow the ark. We have to follow the ark. And it was the priests whose feet touched that water for the first time in full flood. I would put Dalton as the first priest like you. I think you could take it. I mean, if the tide's strong and it takes you out, then we know it's not safe for the rest of us to cross. As, as an apostle, I have to prioritize. I have to know where to position everybody according to their strength. So it's, it's you and Mike, okay? Yeah. If you get taken out, I missed God this time. <laughs> then, then clearly I wasn't, I, you know, I'm like, my bad. I need to go back. <laughs> I missed a, a piece of that. Come on, man, right? <laughs> they had to step out in faith. 
Who had the encounter with the angel? It wasn't all of Israel. It was Joshua. Who wanted to be that first priest? Your, 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 your boss says, hey, hey, you, you and you, you're going to take the ark, the big, heavy gold ark. Yeah, yeah. And you're just going to step into the river Jordan in full flood. Okay. No, there was no indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He couldn't just go back and say, you know, I'm going to, I want to seek God on that. I'm going to spend some time. You know, I just feel like there's more to this revelation. Like, I just need to fast and pray this through to see if we are in alignment here. Joshua, like, <laughs> you know, Moses, like, here's the thing. When Moses came down, his face was like shining. I don't even see some, some like that, that glitter. There's not, you're not, there's not even a, you're not even glowing. Joshua, it's like, you're looking even a little raggedy. You've been in the wilderness like quite a while. You're looking even a bit dusty. <laughs> You know, Moses, you know, you, you know, Moses was the man. <laughs> he came down, he was glowing. We're like, yeah, yeah. You know, we had seen miracles um, under Moses, you know. You know, at first we weren't sure about the guy, but you know, there were plagues. You know, people got killed. We're like, yeah, he's our man. You know, I could get behind that. Moses was incredible. You know, he parted the Red Sea. He gave us manna. We saw, we saw things. Up until this point, how many miracles had Joshua done? Yeah, this was it. This was it. Yeah, so who's, who's, who's jumping to the front of the line saying, me, I'll go first. I believe you, Joshua. I know, I'm the kind of guy that like, I need metrics. I need metrics here first. Like if you could just, you know, let's bring you some water, just part it, make it, you know, make it ripple. Make the water ripple. Then Joshua, we're, you know, we're with you. We're with, we're, we got your back. We got your back. But you know, this new generation, we're a new breed. I find it incredible that the old generation that will complain and have a hissy fit every five minutes wanting to run back to Egypt, we don't see in the next generation. The reality is, the next generation is not one that complains. The next generation is one that does not say, oh, it's the apostles' vision, it's the leader's vision. They're one that says, this is my vision. This is my vision. The next generation is one that sees beyond their gifts and abilities and recognizes that there is a territory that God requires us as a body to possess. So, I present this challenge. Which generation are you? Are you a generation of faith? Is this your baby? Is this your vision? If not, then, you know, stay on the other side of the Jordan. You'll always have manna. God is gracious. You'll always have manna. God didn't, didn't starve the old generation to death. He still took care. But this new generation is crazy. They're crazy. Without any proof, they're just going to step into that Jordan. And they're going to actually expect it to stop. And you know what it will. You know, the biggest difference between what Moses did and what Joshua did is this. Moses always stood up on the hill. You saw him for miles, a great, big, strong leader. with These staff raised high and boom, the miracle took place. The miracles took place with Joshua amongst the people. It was because of the people that the miracles took place. It was because the priests had faith to step in that river because of their obedience and faith that that Jordan stopped. Joshua wouldn't stand there waving his stick over the Jordan. He was marching with the troops to war. They stepped in the Jordan and they stopped the water. You are going to stop the water. Every single one of you here, as you unite and do what God has called you to do as a generation, you will stop the water. You are the miracle makers. You are the world changers. We do this together. This is the next apostolic era that is upon us. It is not about God's man for the hour standing up with his stick anymore. We all have a part to play and comprehend the vast work of God 
we're going to see in this generation. Because it's not up to one guy, one, one great leader, one great person. It's up to every single one of us, which means we combine our faith. We combine our gifts. We combine our hope and our love. And we take the land, we take the territory together as a team. As, as much as you think you know what that promised land looks like on the other side, you have no clue. So before you cross that Jordan, you need to let go of your preconceived ideas of what you think it's going to be there. How can you make a plan and pattern for today, for a vision 10 years from now, where you will not be the same person, you will not function in the same gifts or anointings. You're not God. So before we go into the new season, it requires us to let go of the preconceived ideas of what we think that season is. Because if you take those ideas with you, you're just the children of Israel wandering around the wilderness again. Isn't that what they did? They had all these ideas of what it would be like to take the promised land, right? We're just going to walk in. I mean, God did it for us in Egypt. I mean, he just killed the first bull. He just, just up and with a mighty hand, boom, there was blood, there was death. It was fantastic. Everybody was like, we could take the promised land with this. I mean, we're just going to stand and, and God's just going to come. He's going to send his angels out there and boom, he's just going to kill them all. No problem. And then they actually get there. They get to the border of the promised land and they see giants. They're like, I did not see this coming. No, 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 no. That's, that wasn't what I signed up for, God. That wasn't the idea of what I thought the promised land was. And what happened when they adopted that attitude? Hmm. They got to turn back and wander the promised land, uh, wander the wilderness until a generation arose that was ready to let go of their preconceived ideas. You wonder why God has you wander in that wilderness for so long. God has given you promise after promise after promise, right? And you're like, when is that time going to come? When I'm going to make that switch? Where I start seeing that promised land, where I see that. Well, you haven't obviously been in the wilderness long enough because you still keep telling God what your promised land is and is not. Until you come to a place of emptiness of, actually, I've been in this wilderness so long, I was born here. I don't, I don't have a clue what I'm doing. I don't have the answers. I don't have the pictures. I don't have the visions. At one time, maybe I thought I did, but God, I'm finally at the point where I don't even know what to pray and ask you for. I'm prayed out. I'm asked out. I'm done. Oh, finally, it only took you 40 years. Don't be that guy. I don't know. The older you get, the more you're like, God, you got to hustle, man. You're all young. I look at these young people like, oof, Jesus, you got to hustle. We've got a work to do here. How, many, how, how much more are you going to try and manipulate God into making the promise you want him to make? This is the kind of move I want to see. This is the kind of church I want to see. This is the kind of change I want to see. I want the fruit without the... The fighting. I want the fig trees without the giants. I want, you know, God promises them, I'm going to give you, I, I just sometimes don't get it. I, I'm going to give you houses you did not build. Did it not occur to them they would have to kill said people in those houses? Did they think that they would just be beamed to another country and they could literally just walk in? This is not Star Trek. It's like, what did they think was going to happen when they went to the promised land? Huh? No, so they were just going to walk in because you see, why? Because in, in Egypt, what happened? They knocked on the doors of all of their neighbors and they said, give me your money. And I'd love to see this in real life. It's just everybody go to your neighbor. I need you to go to them. I want you to say, I'd like your um, social security, uh, like, you know, your savings account, you know, your, the bond for your house. Um, would you mind? And they're like, you're a child of God, right? Absolutely. Here we go. You know, the worst part is they said, we promise we'll give it back. 
We're just going to go and worship in the wilderness, and we'll come back. We'll totally give it back to you. Layers. They built the tabernacle with that. Because I can imagine they're thinking, I got God's number. I know he's going to do it. Come to the edge of that promised land. We're just going to knock on the door of the house that somebody else built. We're going to be like, hey, can I have your house? No. (laughs) New rules. New territory. New rules. New territory. It didn't work that way. It worked for Egypt. Moses is dead. Moses is dead. Moses' ways are dead. The way God brought about miracles is dead. The anointing you function in is dead. It's not going to work for the promised land, guys. And while you keep manipulating God to use you the way you want Him to use you for your next season, you're going to keep circling that mountain in the wilderness. Because you're not empty yet. Are you empty enough? We say, more Lord, more Lord. You need a whole lot of less. And when you get to that place... You've got to be that empty to be able to put your foot in a raging river in full flood to say, I'm finally at the point where whatever you say, I'm going to do it. I don't know what's going to happen on the other side. I don't even know how we're going to get all these people on the other side without getting killed. But I'm at such a point in my life, God, where I'm out of prayers now. Have you ever come to that place in your life? Where you're out of prayers? You're out of faith. God gave me this promise. He's going to give me these finances. He's going to give me this. He's going to give me the figs. He's going to give me the grapes. He's going to give me the house. He's going to give me the the bounty. And you've tried so hard to bring it all to pass. And then you just run out of prayers. Next, you just got to step in the Jordan. Because the time of praying and trying to twist God's arm to bring those things to pass is over and a season of obedience is now upon us. They didn't feel the anointing back then, y'all. There were no indwelling. Those priests did not step into that river feeling the power and the glory of God like, yes, Lord. I feel you, Lord, as I step into the... No, there was nothing. They just had the cold water. That's it. But they stepped. And when they stepped, empty after 40 years, in faith, those waters stopped. When they followed the ark... When they followed the Holy Spirit to go where Moses had never gone, that water stopped and they could cross over. There's one more thing I'm going to say about that. And in the next session, I'm going to help you walk into the new season in your promised land. When they crossed that Jordan, when they made the decision to cross the Jordan, the first price they had to pay was letting Moses die. Coming empty. There was another thing that was a hefty price for them. The day they walked over that Jordan, they crossed the path of no return. They couldn't just halfway through and think about it. You know, now that I think about it, I don't think I want to go. I actually got my comfy tent back there. I don't mind manna too much. And my life kind of got a little settled. Now that I think about the price, I might actually pay for this call. You know what? No, it's too late. It's too late. (laughs) Sorry, but your foot is literally in the Jordan. The minute you cross the Jordan, it is a point of no return. There's no change in your mind. There's no going back because when you commit and you take that first step of faith, God carries you the rest of the way. Was was that river closed behind them? It was tickets, done, cheers, done, over. There's no looking back and saying, guys, I I, I, I think we made a mistake here. It's all exciting when it's glory, right? It's all exciting when the promises are coming. And then each one of you finally find yourself on the riverbank of the Jordan where God says, and now I'm doing that thing that I've said I will always do. And you're excited and then it hits you. Hang on a minute. I've literally made a home for myself on the side of the Jordan. 
I didn't realize it until now because I was so busy whining about not having my promise. But actually, now, now that the promise is coming at my face, I'm starting to realize what I'm going to have to let go for it. The, it's like, oh, it's all exciting, you know. Like the first time you go on a ministry trip, it's all exciting. You're on the plane and, you know, it's all exciting, right, the first time. Yeah. After a while, you realize the price is going to take. <laughs> you, you take off, you leave your home behind. Our, God, God has done that to us more times than, than I can count. He did that uh, with us from South Africa to Mexico, Mexico to Switzerland, Switzerland to, to the States, to Mexico. He, he does that. I, I, we have relocated our entire family and ministry multiple times. And at first, when he gives you the word, you're like, yes, God, but wait a minute. I didn't realize how comfortable, how I pitched a tent. I had a family. I grew deep roots. I began to fall in love with the small territory that God gave me. And now God says, the promise is upon you, and the Spirit of God quickens you, and you're like, yes, yes, yes. And then it dawns on you. When you cross that Jordan, be prepared. It's a point of no return. You will never, ever, ever go back to what you have here. When you cross this Jordan that God is putting this family in, you will never return to what this is. And you should start thanking God for that because you have not been this way before. You have not seen the miracles that are coming. You're not seeing the change. You're not seeing the growth that God can do. Get tired of your manner because the day that you cross that Jordan, the manner ceases. But you get grapes. And you didn't even know what a grape was. And you didn't even know how good it could be. You just heard about it from your parents' parents that one day there will be grapes. That's it. But you will get to taste them for yourself. So no. Don't look at what you have now and go, oh, we're not going to have this. We should be, yes, praise God, we're not going to have this anymore. Because we're going to have something so much better on the other side of that Jordan. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you were blessed and encouraged. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more amazing content.